Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Inc., New York's Window Company, New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Beechwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, M&T Bank, Must Development, LLC, Des Moines Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, W Financial Mortgage Fund, the Wickoff Group. Hello, my name is Michael Stoller. The REITs made, raised so much money in 2009, $24 billion, I think. That was only a partial. And, and REITs have done rather well in the stock market last year. So the question is, what's going to happen with the REIT market? What are REIT executives see for 2010? What do they plan to do uh, with their operations? So I've assembled four CEOs of some very prominent REITs to provide their insight on where it is in 2010. My guests today include Jeffrey Gould, the President and CEO of BRT Realty Trust, Neil Shah, the President and CEO of Hersha Hospitality, uh, Stuart Tans, the President and CEO of um, Retail Opportunity Opportunities Investment, Investment. And last but definitely not least, Ken Bernstein, the President and CEO of Acadia, Realty Trust. So let's look at it this way. You're in the retail yes. spectrum. You're in the retail spectrum. Yeah. You're in the hospitality spectrum, and you're in the lending spectrum. So you know, people like you and a lot of investors from around the world are sitting on funds, but there's not much much things happening. You said you just bought one shopping center last year, but you're developing. You bought one hotel. You didn't make too many loans, I would Very assume. Quiet. And you recently bought something. So what do you what do you see there, Ken? What we're seeing is the market's in transition. Let's remember, 2009, the world almost came to an end. And 2008, right, definitely, the world right, came right, to right, an end. Right, well, mm -hmm. it, and it continued through to 2009. Uh, when we were fortunate we were able to pick up a nice $80 million acquisition in 2009, but for the most part, the markets were frozen. Right now, we're seeing a transition where still most of the lenders are kicking the can down the road. So you're not seeing the transa transactional activity pick up yet. But I suspect 2010 will be a very good time for people like our company and the other companies here that have dry powder to put it to work because some of these deals, maybe not billions and billions per week or month, but some of these deals are gonna have to work their way through the system and well-capitalized companies with the ability to restructure deals, take over and fix them, are going to be in a very good position. REITs traditionally do not borrow that much when they buy an asset. You use right. the situation. So, I mean, you said, Stuart, prior to the show, you've recently purchased a couple of grocery anchored shopping centers. Yes. Talk about the, the type of properties you've bought and what type of leverage, or you paid cash and what the situation was. Yeah, I mean, uh, our goal is to build a company that has got a balance sheet uh, that uh, we're trying to build a company that is going to have a very unencumbered balance sheet in terms of its real estate. Uh, the focus there is to eventually get rated and go down and do corporate bonds. Um, 
But so in order to build that type of balance sheet, our focus is to really prefer to pay cash versus to buy assets that we have to assume debt with. Um, so for us, what we have found is having cash in this market is a very powerful tool from the standpoint that there is stress in the system in terms of sellers. And if you can find a seller that uh, is looking to sell and uh, you have the ability to move very quickly in the marketplace, what we are finding is that there is a discount being given to CAT for people who do have cash. Now, are the sellers the, the seller who owns the shopping center or is the seller the lender who owns the shopping center? Primarily, it's the seller who owns the shopping center. And uh, what we continue to see is that a, a lot of people, a lot of sellers uh, and companies went out and leveraged their personal balance sheets between 2004 and 2007 and paid very high prices for real estate uh, in, in different places around the country. By leveraging their own balance sheets, that their balance sheets today, whether it was credit lines or other forms of capital that they used, banks are calling that capital in. And by doing that, it is putting pressure on sellers to do something. Uh, what they're avoiding, of course, is to sell the best asset in this market because they don't want to have to fire sell anything. But we are finding that there is stress out there and we have to work a lot harder to find the opportunities, uh, but they are out there. You know, there are people like your friend over here mm -hmm. who. Let's who be clear, are, we're not friends. Uh, <laughs> the, the enemy over here, right. uh, who basically is looking to do the same thing as you. Mm -hmm. What what differentiates the two of you? Let me take a stab at that. Um, and a lot differentiates us, and, and most of it's favorable to Stuart. You're talking about a billion dollars of buying power in terms of cash that we both have on hand right now. That's not bad. You're talking about over a trillion dollars of debt maturing over the next couple of years. So you can add several billions of dollars before it really even makes a dent. You mentioned $24 billion that was raised. The vast majority of that was not raised the way Stuart raised his for acquisition purposes or the way our capital is set up. Most of that was purely to deleverage the public companies. So the opportunity we have now is to take our dollars, our skill sets, and put them to work in fixing assets, working through busted partnerships, or acquiring for all cash. And, and I do think that that's a differentiation that great companies like Stewart's or companies like ours can do. The, the biggest advantage I think a company like ours have in today's market, it really, in my view, deals with legacy issues. I think that most companies today uh, have really th three things that they focus on when they come in the office. Uh, one is going to be, you know, their tenant base and the issues associated with the tenant base. The second issue is going to be balance sheet issues. Whether they need, the balance sheet needs liquidity or not, there's always these moving pieces that have to be dealt with given what's gone on uh, with the credit crisis. And the third issue, which I think is a very big advantage, is the human capital issue. Um, that's the advantage I believe we have in today's market. We're having fun when we come in, in the office because all we're doing is looking to buy and we don't have to deal with all these legacy issues. Mm. Um, to me, that's a big advantage. Neil, you're in perhaps the business which was affected so poorly, I mean, in 2008 and 2009. Yeah. Uh, the hospitality business at the beginning of 2009 was, as one would say, we were at a awake, uh, nothing was happening. Um, the year ended a little better. Um, so how do you see it? And you're sitting with $200 million of cash also. You know, it, 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 was, it was a devastating couple of years for the industry, worse than any prior period, uh, pre-depression even. Um, so it was, we took a very big hit. Um, on one hand, we don't have as many, we don't have tenant issues. And so that's kind of the negative and the positive. We are reletting our inventory on a daily basis. So when times were tough, that was a very difficult situation. But as we start to see in certain markets in the country some level of recovery, that gets us um, pretty excited and enthusiastic to um, try to use some of our dry powder. We're finding in markets like New York City, the last, call it three to four months, we've seen um, some clear signs of recovery. I, I don't think we're out of the woods by any means, but 
by the end of this year, uh, we feel like um, we'll have recovered from from uh, from 2000. 7, 2008. It's going to take a while to get back to uh, the peaks that we experienced in lodging. And I think there is some secular shifts in kind of demand patterns and the, the role of kind of corporate group houses and luxury hotels. There's, um, we focus on kind of mid-price segment and we focus on transient hotels where people are coming in every day. Um, and that part of the market, we feel we're going to start seeing a recovery this year. What about the extended stay type of hotels? The extended stay, you have to divide them in two. There's kind of upscale extended stay, which caters towards corporate customers, training oriented things, technology, integration, consulting. And there's lower end extended stay, which caters to construction, home builders, construction crews, you know, that level of, of business. That bottom piece of the business, the lower end extended stay has been devastated again. Um, they've also been overbuilt across the last few years. So very difficult part of the market. The upscale extended stay has shown some resiliency. And that's kind of, uh, there are five to seven day stays. You have reduced marketing cost, higher margin, and that part of the market's worked out okay. Jeff, the mortgage rates. Tough, tough, nearly as bad or probably worse than uh, the uh, hospitality. We're hanging in. We're doing all right. So what what has happened? What have you done in 2009? What do you plan to do in 2010? T 2009 was, as you said, a, a very quiet year um, as far as originations go. I think 2010, the beginning of it, is, is starting out a little bit more robust. Um, towards the end of 2009, we saw a lot of opportunity of, of uh, guys going in and looking to, or borrowers looking to buy back their debt at discounts from banks that were looking to get off uh, some loans off their balance sheets. So we had a pretty busy December, uh, and it's starting to fill out where the, where the same situation is happening, where most of the business we're seeing right now is in the, is in the debt repurchase, whether it's uh, buying direct your property uh, debt at a discount, and we're assisting those borrowers, or in a case where third-party debt's being purchased, uh, where guys are just looking, borrowers are looking for opportunities to take on this, these debt opportunities. For, for example, let's say somebody wanted to buy their own debt and they, or another person wanted to buy somebody else's debt. Would you require the borrower, the person over there, to put in additional equity or will you fund the entire situation? No, we, we t typically almost in every occasion that we've looked at in the near term, we've uh, always wanted additional new, ca new fresh equity coming into the transactions. I mean, to build the borrower and know that the borrower's got new invested capital gives us a lot of comfort and clarity. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is that Neil and both Ken have also acted in a lending position. In it. So will you continue to lend money? Because you have money, and both of you have money, and if you can get a higher yield, with, then you're sitting on it at the bank, uh, where you're earning uh, half a point, wouldn't it be better to possibly have an opportunity? Yeah, I think like in a theoretical world, it, it always feels that way. And that's why we got into the lending business to a certain degree. But in, in today's market, we feel like having the equity control position has the opportunity to get a two times multiple on your equity, while the yields on debt are interesting and attractive. But in the end of the day, it's mid-teens kind of return. And we think we're in an opportunity. We have an opportunity across this next year to acquire at 30 to 40 percent discounts to kind of stabilized values. We, we like being where there's, we still have the, the 70 percent loan to value in today's marketplace and having the new equity coming in is significant. That, that's so a, you, that's you an interesting question else. because a couple of weeks ago I, I did three shows with lenders. Uh, the first show was with domestic lenders, the second show was with six German lenders. And uh, the question that I said to all of these, I had 12 lenders on the show, uh, was what is value today? And it's debt yield more than value, I think, I in this yeah. situation, right? That's probably true. That was certainly true over the past year. I do think you're going to have much better visibility over the next 12 to 24 months as to what is value. The reason people were punting on that was it was in a declining net operating income and a declining rental market. You really struggled with how low could the asset revenues go, and then where were interest rates and thus cap rates that we're buying going to settle. I think you're starting to see both of those have better visibility, and you will hear loan to values come back. Debt yield will matter, um, and it may not come back to the same level of mm -hmm. loan to values of the Lehman Brothers days, but I think we'll get back to value. I'd go as far as saying 
that we may have seen a trough in cap rates towards the end of last year, and we'll see the trough in cash flows, at least for lodging, sometime this year. So I think there's been kind of a, there's been a 40% kind of discount on assets generally across the country, in lodging at least. And out of that, 20, 25% of that <coughs> is reduced cash flows. And then there's that other 20, 25% which is what I would call kind of an illiquidity discount because there were no transactions. So to get anyone motivated to do anything, you had to have a ridiculously high cap rate to motivate that. And I think as transactions start to pick up this year, that 20, 25% of kind of discount will go away and we'll be dealing with. Uh, there were certain transactions, uh, three of them in New York City last year, where the properties were sold for a price that the land was worth more a couple right. of years ago. Uh, for New York Plaza, a 41-story building built about 40 years ago, owned by J.P. Morgan, originally the Manny building, uh, sold for $97 a square foot. I mean, you could not build that building for $97 a foot. <laughs> uh, the AIG buildings in Lower Manhattan sold for $105 a square foot. So, you know, when you're looking at a shopping center, or you're looking at a shopping center, or if you're looking at a hotel, you know, you, you, you say to yourself, hey, isn't this a great opportunity? Or if you're lending money, you're saying the bricks are worth a certain amount. It skewed everything in this well, situation. That was a unique point in time. Uh, Ken, it closed in January of 2010. January. I, don't, I don't call that a unique, uh, <laughs> I, distant time. I, I, you did not see that many transactions of high quality real estate trading at a discount, not to replacement cost, but to construction cost. And those people who were able to take advantage of those opportunities, I think are gonna be very happy that they did. The a deal we, that I was talking about before that we acquired in Northern Westchester, we were able to buy a Walmart anchored center at a discount to construction cost. Unique period of time, it was about a 9% yield going in. And we're now taking it up close to a 10. We couldn't replicate that today. Wish I could. But the good news is that the market is solidifying. And the other side of it, because we're all publicly traded companies, is there's some other unique benefits that I think that our shareholders are going to experience over the next one, three, five years by the fact that we can access so, the public so, market. So tell us mm -hmm. what benefits that the shareholders are going to. Along with being able to raise dollars and do it as do cash, you, we have cash. Do you believe 2010 will be the same type of opportunity to raise money like, like, like the REITs had in 2009? 2009, the quote, opportunity to raise money was at relatively low share prices. Right? It was a painful process for anyone who was trying to clean up their balance sheet. It was just a necessary process to enable Companies, but to then certain move REITs like Vornado even raised money, you know, in bond issues, not to, which didn't well, dilute their uh, right, sure. their share prices right. at all. And you've seen debt. And I think you did too, right? Yeah, yeah we ended up doing equity then in the end uh, this year, but last year we raised, we brought in a strategic investor for a small stake in the business and access to their joint venture capital. But in the end, at the beginning of this year, uh, we decided to to do a more broadly marketed public offering, uh, just to to kind of put the leverage issues kind of behind us and to have some capital to take advantage of the opportunities. We think it's kind of finite, the opportunities. I, I don't see the opportunities quite as, uh, as involved and as exuberant uh, that you guys see this in the coming year. I think things are quiet, things will remain quiet for the next period of time. I mean, there'll be some buying opportunities, but the typical seller-buyer transaction's not happening. Banks aren't taking over assets as readily as you might think, and uh, I, I suspect that this is gonna be a quiet time for another six to nine months minimum. Uh, yeah, in, I, in I actually months. think the transactional market is, is going to be a long, it's, it's much further out. I believe that it could be as long as three to four, maybe five years before the transactional market comes back. And the reason why I believe that it will occur is because any owner today who owns a good piece of real estate as long as they can continue to extend and pretend, they will continue to do that. And if they also have floating rate LIBOR loans, exactly. they're, they're in a much better position. Right, I think the, it's gonna the, be the, some the, the time. The borrower who has that fixed rate loan at seven and a half, and they don't have the cash flow because the rents are down. Historically, the, the banks took over these assets, had a fire sale, sell these assets to new buyers. 
today the banks are just, as you said, extending, and the owners continue to own. They continue to have cash flow because the lower LIBOR rates, and everyone's sitting pretty. Not much is happening. You know, there's $1.6 trillion of loans that are going to you know, mature within the next two to three years, and they're in every category that we're, we're talking about. You can have a lot of money, and there are other people out there, but these loans don't deserve. They, they, they were underwritten at prices which can't do it to right. them. So a certain portion of that $1.6 trillion, and the data we're seeing probably says maybe it's only a trillion dollars of real estate value there, and that will have to get recognized. And I, and I agree with that. If I made it sound as though I think 2010 is when the floodgates open, I don't. I think this is going to be a long process. I think that those companies, especially public ones, uh, that have capital today and have the ability to put that money to work will be rewarded. And I think that public companies that can access capital going forward will be able to over the next several years. Let, let, let's bring up the subject of accessing capital. Accessing, how, how, how are you seeing accessing debt from lenders today? Uh, I mean, there were three deals in the retail spectrum last year that were securitized, you know, mm -hmm. the DDR and so on. Yep. Um, there will be some securitization. Uh, I've been with Goldman, I've been with J.P. Morgan and Kanta Fitzgerald, but there's going to be a lot of others. Now, some of the people, many of the money center banks, you were talking about uh, the people who took over your debt, they're not doing loans. You know, they're, they're sitting there. I mean, mm -hmm. so where are you seeing Money well, I, I think uh, the big advantage we all have in terms of debt capital is that we all have very well capitalized companies because REITs as a structure have to have relatively low leverage. That to me is a big advantage in terms of accessing debt capital. So all these great companies here will have the ability, from a lender's perspective, they would rather loan money to us than anyone else. So I think when Ken articulates that you know, REITs have an advantage in the market and will continue to have an, uh, an advantage. He's absolutely right because I don't think banks want to go now, to... Now, now, do you see more companies becoming REITs? Yeah, I, I think mean, REITs will be part of the solution in, in the commercial real estate mess. Um, I think l much like it was in the 90s. It is a way to, to create um, liquidity and, and to give people hope for, for some of their value through, through shares. But I hope that the public markets are going to remain focused on only floating those companies that truly have high quality management teams. But they are but they're also private REITs. I mean, Inland yeah. is a private REIT. You know, there Wells is a private REIT. Do you see? I mean, the, the, the there are three vehicles that are basically, in in my view, that are coming to the market as we're sitting here to, uh, today. One is the IPO vehicle, which is something that I went through in 1997 and, and experienced, but. That is where you've got a, a real estate operating company that has got a balance sheet that needs to be delevered. I believe there is, a, and you will see a number of those companies come to the public markets. The second is a blind pool of equity, which is something that I just went through and experienced and, and worked with. And that is a experienced executive who has been, who, who has had success in the capital markets and have the ability to take that success back to the public markets and raise capital. And the third is the non-traded REIT. That's the Wells um, format. There is already a series of non-traded REITs that are heading to the public markets. So all three of those are, are in, the, in the midst of capturing equity or recapitalizing themselves currently in the public markets. Jeff, there, there have been a number of companies who've become finance companies who have, and also have gone to the public market to raise money for debt. And then the window closed. They, they were able to, and then the window closed. Yeah. There are a lot of people running around looking to buy distressed debt. The reason why we put the, our niche and our platform together to assist guys in buying and borrowers in buying this, their debt is because so many people were out there looking to buy direct. Um, the, the amount, I mean, there were hundreds of people coming out in the last, I don't know, three to six months. And I think that did, that did stop and slow down considerably, but there's only so much product that's out there. The, again, the banks have not taken back the product. No, I'm, o I'm also talking about the entities, you know, like the the, the, the Apollo mm -hmm. uh, and, and the rates, uh, who's a REIT. We just uh, closed a deal with Apollo two days ago, actually, on a loan. Um, eight and a quarter percent. It was kind of a 
probably a 55% LTV loan on an asset that didn't have 12 months of trailing history, but close to it. Which, which is very interesting because a year ago, that there was, there was no, any, no one out there, but you do have the Apollos, you do have the Winthrop mm -hmm. uh, and, and some others who are out there who raise money and who want to put out money because if they get eight and a half or nine and they leverage it on their line, they're going to get a higher percentage. That's right. So I think, I think that's been very helpful to your business. I think it has. And I think it could even be helpful, but not to you because fortunately you have enough capital so on. Right. And again, depending. Hotels will borrow and can afford to borrow at a different rate than retail, which is more stable. And, and thankfully, we're finding plenty of lenders willing to lend to us for high quality assets. The mm -hmm. only lenders that we're seeing taking us at, we're looking at a lot of multifamily deals right now for, uh, to finance. And the only takeout lender there is HUD and Fannie. And the re reality of it is, I'm, I'm talking on garden apartments, multifamily. You know, here in the city, there's plenty of local regional guys. Yeah, doing local it. regional guys. But they're, they're, are the there. only thing they're doing is resident is, is multifamily. Yeah, they're, they're doing uh, rent regulated multifamily. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know how, if, if there's plenty of guys in the retail space. That's that's wonderful. It, I don't. The same problem that we all complain that there's a lack of product out there to buy. Lenders are complaining that there's a lack of assets that they can put safe mortgages on because most refinancings right now, if there's equity, are at the 90 uh, plus I percent mean, level. You know, they, they don't want to do the little pizza, the retail with, you know, with, which is unanchored with a shopping center, <coughs> you know, with a, a supermarket. You know, they're, they're a little cautious. You yeah. know, they remember that last year there was Circuit City, mm -hmm. Stephen Barry, and some other uh, retailers who yeah. did go out of business. And, uh, they were well, and you brought up a great point. I think the biggest challenge for retail is the consumer and what's gone on with the consumer and where the consumer may stay for a while. I mean, everything has shifted to value uh, or discount retailing is, is doing very well. But there has been a, a, a meaningful shift in terms, no matter where you are in, in the spectrum of, of wealth, um, the reality is even wealthy people are now shopping at TJ Maxx and Ross. And I believe that shift is here for a while. Um, whereas in the last recession, we came out of it quite quickly and the consumer went from going to value back to, you know, buying luxury items and specialty retailers very quickly. For, for, and for the older people here, cycles change. And, you know, this was a tough one. Yeah. It'll take a little while to get better. Uh, and I think... Uh, my uh, my viewers really got a good opinion from some dynamic read executives of what's happening. I'd like to thank Jeff Gould, Neil Shah, Stuart Tans, and Ken Bernstein. See you next week. Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Inc., New York's Window Company, New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Beechwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, M&T Bank, Must Development, LLC, Des Moines Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, W Financial Mortgage Fund, The Wickoff Group.